we're gonna hit the easy but I mean we're gonna uh, fish the clinch like I say depending on the flow if they're running a bunch of turbines and really pumping the water out like they are today then you gotta crank the speed up anywhere from two miles an hour to like I'm doing 15 or 20 well, we'll be back when we hook up. school fishing hello and welcome to tonight's show all right well where are like that jr do you, have, do you ever work <laughs> yeah every day <laughs> so uh where are the stripers at boys are they heading up river they where are is there any current like i've been hearing a lot of uh bad reports of there not being a lot of flow around here there ain't been no rain well you know when there's when there's not as much current are you are you going to stay in the river or would you prefer going in the creeks like you know when, when it comes to that spring run you know when they're on that fall spawn of course i have actually heard of some of the uh i've heard of people finding like little bitty fingerlings in like kerr reservoir so I imagine, like, you know, there probably are a handful of the eggs that tumble somehow long enough to to hatch. But, yeah, I mean, okay, so you got, uh, let's say, Clark's Hill. You got a reservoir that has a lot of creeks. It's not necessarily like a riverine reservoir. It actually it branches off into a, a lot of uh, arms. Um, are these fish, when they start to head up river, are they – are they staying in the river channel? Are they getting out on the flats? Are they are they heading up the creeks? Like where are they going, Scott? Right now? Yeah. They've already made their run now. They've already spawned out. I mean, most of them have. Let's see. But the first day of summer is June twentieth. So I mean, we're still well over a month away. You know, we still have well over a month of spring left. So these these stripers are pretty much already spawned out, huh? Well, I mean, most of them, I think, are. I, our, our, really, our run's mostly end of April to the beginning of May, like right now. Yeah. And then they don't really run up the rivers here to spawn. I mean, they'll run up a creek or some run all the way up, some run halfway up. It's We don't have a lot of flow. Even during a rainy season, we don't have a ton of flow. So they just work. Have you ever heard that joke? Uh, there are two stripers swimming uh, upriver to spawn, and one of them hit a concrete wall, and he looked at the other one and said, "Damn." He said, "There's Anthony and Dare." <laughs> <laughs> I caught a I caught a female striper about two years ago. I think it was July, and she actually still had a little belly on her. But when I went to hold her up, this black shit started coming out of her. And it is, I don't remember if it was Terry McConnell or somebody told me that sometimes it's unusual, but sometimes the females won't spawn. They won't drop their eggs like they're supposed to. Um, and that's what happens to eggs actually rotted in them. Have you ever heard of that, Scott? Oh, wow. I've never seen it. Never really heard of it. But, but yeah. I, I know dnr has said that they've tracked fish that spawned on the lower end you know first red point they came to some ran all the way up to the top you know so i think we can we confuse these saltwater fish putting them in lakes so. yeah <laughs> but they still think they can uh lay eggs and hatch they don't know that they're not able to so they do it i've always thought it, it it takes around 72 hours or so a few days for the eggs to tumble. And that's why they don't is because in like 
when they spawn, like let's say they spawn up at the dam in the river portion and the, and the eggs start to tumble down, um, it's not going to take very long before they're, they're hitting deep water. You know, once they hit the deep water, they're just going to sink to the bottom and, you know, they're not, there's not oxygen down there. So they're just going to die. They're not going to continue to tumble and stay aerated. Well, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't, in South Carolina, we had, you know, years ago when they were studying it, we had literally thousands of stropper spawning, you know, going up, going all the way up in the Congaree and the Watery. They were going up as far as the Congaree and the Watery to spawn. And, and there was natural reproduction for years in Santee. Now, I don't know if there still is or if they're still even doing studies of that, but I, I've heard that the striper fishing at Santee that since they put the regulations in almost five years and four years ago now has really, really helped that lake. But I, you know, I hadn't been down there since I started going to Tennessee. Yeah. Before. I heard, I heard that it's helped it. I heard it's on the up and up. People are catching good fish and more fish out of there. Now I think they spawn naturally in uh, the noose river. Maybe is it the noose or the, the Dan river Roanoke river? Yeah. One of those rivers up there, Northern part of the state. But I don't know. I, I know the Noose River is pretty. It's a pretty big river. It's like six or eight miles across. I think at, at its widest point. But Scott, like what? When you're when you're going out there this time of year, even though these fish have already spawned out, I mean, you're still not are you're still not targeting them in deep water yet, are you? You're still kind of keeping it fifteen feet or less, or? Well, they may be spawning now, but they're close. They're spawned out. Um, without the flow. It's more of a temperature thing with our fish. Like, if I'm way up in the creeks and say February, March, and then as it gets warmer, you just move down them rivers. You know, they're still going to come up on points and flats and feed, but they're going to they're going to be more than seventy foot of water. You know, and then yeah. they're going to move up to feed. And as the year goes on, you just follow them down mostly. The big groups. I mean. You can catch big fish in July way up the rivers, but that's not the groups of fish. The groups of fish are moving down. And they'll eventually, once the water temperature hits 80 degrees, you know, the majority of your fish are going to be on the lower end. And yeah. The deeper creeks, the 70-foot creeks and rivers. But, yeah, we don't really target flow on our lakes, most of them. Not the ones I tournament fish. So, I would. Uh, go ahead. I would – uh <laughs> they used to call me planter board Perry. I'd pull planter boards up until uh, planter board Perry. I'd pull them up till uh, June, but then I, you know, I'd weight them down as as we got into May and to June. I'd weight them down, but you know, I wasn't very good back then either. But <laughs> mm -hmm. so I learned cut baiting as a necessity when the water temperature gets up in the seventies. For me, it was either down riding, which I hate, or Bait, so. Yeah, I if noticed I um, with the fish that Heather caught yesterday, I think it was yesterday, mm -hmm. um, that was some pretty good sized pieces of cut bait y'all were using. Yeah, we pulled that morning. I usually don't start out cut baiting, but sometimes I do. But uh, yeah, we, I mean, if you're going to, you're going to take herring and cut bait, you're going to catch a lot more fish, but. If you're only going like me, I only go two or three times a month. So I just yeah. go out there to target the trophy fish. So Wes, you're going where are you where are you going uh in a couple of weeks, bud? Well <laughs> don't get so excited, Wes. <laughs> I'll know the weather's killing us now. Uh we're supposed to go down with Rusty Griffin. Welcome to Saltwater. I know, right? I was supposed to go down with Rusty Griffin either tomorrow and or we're going to go Friday. And, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's my twin brother. <laughs> Damn. Okay. What am I doing? And, uh, anyway, we're supposed to go down to uh, Charleston maybe this the middle of this week, and fish weather says, no, I'm not. So um, then I had another buddy, Josh, Gonna go out with Josh. We're actually gonna go out to the Gulf Stream and fish weather said no, you're not. So now uh meter me and Peter Malik. Peter wants me to come to North Carolina up at, up at Hatters. I think we're gonna go out of Hatters and maybe go fish the the deep frying pan thing, whatever you call that. What do you call it, JR? 
Frying pan tower. Yeah, the frying pan tower. I watched a video on that thing today. It looks like this guy, this this cat buys it. He bid eighty thousand dollars on it in an auction, and didn't even really expect to win it, but he won. Yeah, yeah. So so, so he built what they call the world's most dangerous motel on top of it, um, and you can rent it through Airbnb now. Uh, you know, and they were showing videos of it. It's just like literally three and four inches of rust and where stuff is just rust is just falling apart. So I don't know how legally, how legally he's doing that, renting something to people that they say is quote, the most <laughs> unsafe motel in the world. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, That's anyway, like place. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but no, that, you know, so I, we're thinking about going out there, but right now, you know, uh, I've really been blessed. I've got four different people that want to take me fishing and show me some different things about saltwater. Uh, Mike Bradford, I'm going to be going with him here in about two months down to Venice. I've never been down there before. So, I mean, you know, it's, I got a lot of people fishing to show me a lot of stuff. And, like, you know, I've had people already hit me on Messenger. What do I want to, am I going to sell my stuff? What do I want for this? What? I have not quit striper fishing. I still love to striper fish. I just want to do something different, you know. Patrick Miller went to barbecue. Then he then he went to make fucking with them little bitty Mexican trucks with the dice on the rear rearview mirror. Yeah, I mean everybody just kind of wants something different, you know. And I'm just gonna go to Saltwater and see how I like it. So that's where we at. Well, I think that you'll like it, but I don't. But it's not like that's gonna be your primary. I mean, you're you're gonna come back to the stripers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you will. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, let's see. You know, listen, I tell you, though, when I, I watch these videos, you know, and I was watching these guys, and they were actually not real. They were trolling, I think, like 12 knots, 15 knots for Wahoo. And when one of those fish hits and that rod just lays down and that drag is screaming, you know, that's that – it's, it's about to hit for me. I guess that's always, you know, why I like striper fishing. I like that hit. Mm -hmm. And then – but in the ocean, you don't never know. I mean, you could you could – be out there fishing for dolphin and catch a wahoo, hit a tuna, you know, a big kingfish, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you just don't know. So, you know, well, I mean, of, even the dolphin are going to fight, you know, just as hard, as, or if not harder than a striper. Yeah. So it's just going to be something different. I think a dolphin. Yeah, Mahi. Yeah, Mahi hit pretty hard. They say they're the dumbest fish. I mean, if you're though. not going to catch a dolphin, I mean, dolphins are like, Second smartest behind us on the planet. Like, they'll take they'll, they'll take the uh, live bait off your hook without getting hooked. Yeah, they're insanely smart. I mean, I have heard of people hooking them though, but I mean, they, say, they say you if you hook a dolphin, you're not going to get it in. Like, <laughs> like it'll dump a one thirty. <laughs> we were uh, down at we fished down when the weather's bad. That's the big. That's the big thing about striped uh, saltwater fishing. I can't stand is you can't. I mean, you can't pick your days. Like I've hauled my boat nine hours, probably going on five years, and I've only had a window to go out a day or two. I mean, before that, I'd go every day and be glass. But I mean, it's just the weather windows rough. Yep. You got to travel. Yeah, that'll. Man, that'll, but get on, when, that'll get on your nerves bad. When the weather's bad, you can fish, you know, the jetties or inshore. And we've had dolphins just pick our cigar minnows right off the hook because you can see your rod go over and then yeah. the dolphin come up and you reel in, there'll be no bait. You throw back yeah. out there and they do it. You might as well, if the dolphins are around, you might as well just forget about it. You know, I've seen a bottlenose dolphin. I'm talking a big one. I'm talking, you know, 10 footer and the, and the very back of Merle's Inlet before been back there on my kayak and I'm talking like half the body out of the water yeah, yeah. I mean this I it was shallow mm -hmm. and this thing is just it's just knows exactly where to go it's crazy they're so smart they go back there and eat them redfish and trout <laughs> yeah they kill them but you know everybody was talking I, I don't know if y'all seen that post I put up earlier uh you know, everybody's talking about those, you know, the uh, spinner sharks being trash fish. You don't want to listen. Don't knock it if you ain't never caught one, because I'm telling you, that's one of the craziest hits I've ever had in my life since I've been saltwater, you know, since I've been fishing, period. I've never got smoked that bad. 80-pound braid, you know, a, eight all, a, a Shimano 8,000 bait runner, 
And that fish smoked the shit out of that $300 reel like it wasn't nothing. Now, I don't even think he knew it was hooked up. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's what I like. You know, I don't care if you don't catch him, you don't get him to the boat. He ain't going to tear nothing up. Talking about he's, people say, oh, they'll tear your shit up. What the fuck's he going to tear up? A leader? It ain't like you're going to throw your rod out there and let him tear it up. So, you know. I'd like to see you catch an amberjack. I caught one. I yeah. caught one 44 pounds. There you go. And I'll hurt for a week. Yeah, man. Those things will kick your butt. I'd like to see you go out there and power jig for us. Yeah. Well, hey, I can believe can, can you leave it in the rod holder and why? <laughs> Oh my God! My cousin always wanted to do that. We'd throw these big butterfly jigs, and he he'd be over there. I'm like, I am not doing that. Yeah, I'll, even do, them, I'll do it for a minute, but yeah, I'm not gonna sit there and do that. Even them young guys that are in shape have about five drops, and they're done for a while. It looks yeah. fun, though. It does look fun. I actually I've actually hooked on to a fish doing that, a, a grouper, but I couldn't I couldn't get him up. He he took me in the hole and broke me off. You know what's crazy? I was watching this kingfish video. These guys were actually king commercial fishing for kingfish, and they were literally what do you call it, Scott? When you hook the fish and just bring him over the boat with your line, you don't boat flipping. flipping. Yeah, boat flipping. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they were just like they were boat flipping these thirty and 35, 40 pound kingfish. Just you know, and this guy went to boat flip one, and he seen him, and, and a hammerhead just came up. I'm talking about this fish looked like he was forty pounds and just left nothing but a head about that big and that's just that's just king, crazy dude kingfish are really easy to target and they're really fun and you can target them in short well less than 10 miles 10 miles out five miles out shoot you can target them on the pier they're not about they're not really good for anything but they fight like hell and they're easy to catch i mean you I people eat them there's a thing yeah. called a, dr- a drone spoon if you don't yeah. want to make like uh Bonita strips and skirts, you can put a drone spoon out there and whack them. What's that one rig that's like the most popular king rig? Not, is it the duster or something like that? Something yeah, like that. The, with the, it's got the little sea witch skirt. Yeah, little sea witches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Sea witches. And you take a bonita or a mullet and you just fillet it and you hook it on the strip. double hooks. And yeah. Oh. I like to do a slow troll for kings that we do stripers with live cigar minnows. I've done it with I've done it with Menhaden with uh, yeah. you know you know ninety pound Malin wire haywire yes. twist <laughs> stinger hook and troll about two miles an hour with live Menhaden or even drift and even with frozen cigar minnows you can do it and uh, man when they hit on a bait that's barely moving <laughs> I mean. It goes from zero to 60 real quick. It's fun. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and you talking about like, and and my buddy Kelly Morgan, Kelly, he, he sent he already he sent me some numbers. You know, he said, wish you can go out there 15, 18 miles right there out of Merle's Inlet. You know, there's some reefs and stuff out there, some man-made reefs. Mm-hmm. He said, you can go out there and bottom fish and catch fish. Um, you know, I know a, a lot of people don't like bottom fishing. Um I caught a couple of bee liners last year down there, you know, but we were in the Gulf Stream. And that just didn't really interest me a whole lot. Um, Bottom fishing for red snappers fun, and that's all you'll catch, and you won't be able to keep them. Are they completely <laughs> they, they, out of season now? And they're always out of season. You can't even keep a red snapper no more? I think there's like one month a year that you can keep them. And then they're slotted, right? Nah, there's a size, there's a bottom, but not a top. I don't man, I'll I tell you what, man, when I did it, my cousin and I, we, um, if we caught a strawberry grouper, gag grouper, snapper, it, it didn't matter. If black bat, if it was, if <laughs> it, it went in the cooler. Mm-hmm. We went, we went down to <laughs> Destin about five years ago and we went out bottom fishing at like 10 miles out and, uh, we caught probably, 40 red snapper, big red snapper. Couldn't keep them. And down there, Dustin's the uh, Coast Guard station. So you're checked all the time. So I'm not going to try to bring anything there. Yeah. But the next year, we went down the same time. It was snapper season. So I was pumped. So uh, we went out there. There wasn't nothing. So I went to the bait shop, 
you know, the local bait shop there and I asked him and he said, man, he goes, the commercial guys, they go to the first reef and fish it till it's empty. Then the second one, fish it till it's empty. You know, they're saving fuel. He said, so you're not going to catch any snapper till you go way out now. Mm. But when they're not in season, you can catch them five, ten miles right off the coast, like one after another. Hey, Chris Brown said something on here, you know, and I was thinking about this the other night. He said I tr he was trolling boards in the intercoastal down in Florida with mullet. People thought he was crazy. Well, I can agree with that. But I was just wondering, too, you know, could you, like, not really high-speed troll, you know, like 15, 16 knots, but, you know, could you pull, like, kingfish? If you're kingfish, what, what's your trolling speed for kingfish, Scott? Well, you can slow troll for them just like we do stripers with live bait or frozen. And I was surprised I couldn't. We had a hurricane come in, and I couldn't sabiki any cigar minnows. And the guy at the bait shop told me, he said, use frozen ones. And I'm like, well, I want a slow troll. He's like, it don't matter. So I would take a king rig with the hook, with the treble hook wire, hook the frozen cigar minnow, put it out there with planter boards and free lines, and I would troll six, six one. No, like one. Oh, okay. That's what I was going to say. Could you actually use those planter boards in the ocean to yeah. troll? Absolutely. Yeah. Get more bait out in the water. But you don't, you're probably better off running two lines because when you, I mean, if you get, if you get one hook up, you're probably going to get two, and you don't want to get five. <laughs> hey, Mike, I think it was Mike Bradford told me this, you know, talking about structure and how fish in the ocean. Um, uh, and I think JR even told me, if you see a milk jug floating, fish it. <laughs> he said it don't make it down if it's a milk jug, you fish yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah pelagic fish, they, I mean, the bait <laughs> fish are going to, just like when bait fish get under a dock, I mean, they're going to get under, they'll get under your boat if you're sitting there long enough. Mm -hmm. But yeah. like fish, I mean, they're, they just patrol. I mean, I just put bait out and go with them pretty much. I like to be around a reef, you know, but I don't have to be on top of it. Just somewhere in the vicinity of it. And you're going to hook up with kingfish. A lot of people yeah. don't target them. I mean, they're easy, really. Mike Bradford said, uh, he said, Wes, he said some of the most insane fishing in salt water happened about three months after Hurricane Katrina. Um, he said from when the hurricane, you know, all the stuff, all the debris, the tornadoes and stuff blew out. He said there was one guy that marked and they 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 found out later that he was actually fishing around dead cows, cattle, where a tornado had blew a lot of the cattle and stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> out in the water. I bet you know, fishing was amazing. Cattle. Are we yeah. talking salt water? If we are, I'm going to go get something. Um, or are we yeah. talking stripers? Go get it. We'll, we'll, and, we'll uh, come back to stripers. we got an hour. Anyway, you know, and he said all this all this structure was blown out in the ocean. You know, and he said that was some of the most amazing fishing that he's ever heard of in salt water. I bet. All a month after Katrina. He said every pelagic fish down there was off the coast right there. I mean, yeah. Because all that cover off, they had all that structure to go to. Yeah. Yeah, they were following the bait. Yeah. Bait was getting on that structure. That's exactly what he said. Yeah, I would, uh, when I would fish with King for Kings, the only time I would go slow is when I was pulling live menhaden. It didn't matter. Any, anything else, I was trolling six miles an hour. Well, like I said, this is a new, this is going to be a new adventure in my life. And it's something else, you know, I just want to learn, you know, and, Go out one day and say, "Hey, I went out myself and caught some wahoo." Yeah. I, I mean, hey, you're you're doing the right thing. You know, you, people do too much research. Like, get the ink out of your face and go out there and get some hands-on experience. I think that's the best thing for you to do. So, okay. Wes, I'll have a guy in a minute. Have you heard of inline planer fishing in the ocean, Wes? I know J R. You talking about those little metal plane ones? I used the little metal planer boards. Yeah, they if you, like metal. Yeah, if I you run, them, I've never used them. If Old salty. Work, yeah, I mean, especially when the water gets warm, you want to get your bait down. Yeah. But to save you a ton of money, to run an inline planer, you need that heavy rod like JR had on the last show. Yeah. Because, I mean, they pull hard. And then you got to hand line them in. You know, that so that, when they're pulling, let's see, where's my arm? When they're winding, then they're pulling the line with it. Oh, the, the planer is going to be like 100 feet from your bait. So once you reel up to the planer, then you're going to have to hand line your leader. 
yeah, the leader all the way in. Well, this is a cheap way, and you can use your striper gear. Is you got the, you got your inline planer, right? Uh -huh. And you got a hundred foot of two hundred fifty pound test, mono, and a swivel, which you, you clips. So you can clip this on your, uh, you drop your planer in and run it down and clip this on your the back of your boat. Cleat. On your cleat, exactly. And then you can take, a, you can, this will be, where am I? This will be running like this off the back of your boat. And you can hook a swivel to this and put a rubber band on it and rubber band it to your main line. You pull 100 feet off. Rubber banded on there, this will slide down. It'll pull your bait all the way to the bottom. And when a fish hits, it pops that rubber band. So Same basically what you're doing, you can you use like... You're not the board no more. Yeah, you can use like... Right. You don't have to invest in all this heavy equipment. You can use your striper gear basically to kingfish. You just got to invest in this. You have a, Don't you have a downrigger, Wes? No. Mm -hmm. But then when you say downrigger, I'm thinking about maybe a six ounce egg, a six ounce egg sinker. But the problem with downriggers, though, is with a down planer, you could troll up to six, seven miles an hour. But the downrigger, you're limited to like three. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can go heavier on the the downrigger ball, you know. Plus, how much does the downrigger cost? Four, five, six hundred dollars? <throat> I don't know. I got an old Canon one. West, I mean, I, to it. I got like uh, great. I probably got what fifty bucks in this whole setup. Yeah, one hundred fifty pound monos. I used. Uh, I think I had four hundred pound mono for the one I had on my cleat, but I actually just left mine on the cleat. Like I literally would just wrap the the four hundred pound mono around the. I cleat think this and, and this is two fifty, and it's current. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that should last you. So you're you're leaving that you're you're tying that mono off to your cleat. Mm -hmm. The flame board's keeping your bait down, and then when the fish hits it, the rubber band just snaps. And so then your then your flame board's just laying there. No, well, it's still pulling in the water. It's still, it's still out. pulling in the water, but yeah. it's loose from. So you're just fighting fish without like right. the way we do. We just pop a clip, but our flame board's right. right. It's just like a down right. rigger, and then you just have a bunch of swivels, and you just rebate or put your drone spoon on hook your swivel another rubber band send it down i mean i just this is like only my second year using it but i love it because a lot of times when i go say september october you know a lot of the fish are down in the water column and um it, i mean it was, we caught like seven fish in 30 minutes only bad part is pulling them bastards back in when you're done. Yeah. You, know, you can triple them though, right? You just pull it and trip them. Like the ring come up and then they kind of, they're a little Yeah, easier. but it's a fish to trip it without a rod. You got to yeah. pull the line all the way up as high as you can, go slack and then pull it again and then it'll trip. But easier said than done. Yeah. Well, you still going to take me to Charleston for too long, aren't you? I meant to, uh, uh, where was we? Where was mean you gonna go? Oh, Buford. Buford. Yeah. I think. Uh, I mean, we can go Buford like around September and Bull Drum come up in them rivers like crazy. Your boat would be perfect for that. We thought we was gonna do some cobia fishing. Yeah, uh, cobia's probably this month and next month. So maybe go down for two days. We can find a cheap enough place. I'm poor. <laughs> I might sleep in the Dodge if it runs. I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping the truck for. That's why I bought my truck is so I can sleep in it while I'm fishing. It's like the size of a twin bed back there. Why not? I'm gonna be the Michael Walker of saltwater fishing. I'll be you pull up, go fish with me. I'll be in the damn uh, truck. I had a bath in three days. Fuck it, let's go fishing. Trevor Brown said, "Run a bridle so you can wind on." Yeah, that's true, Trevor. You can, but you still got to have a heavy. Heavy rod to pull. Uh, what is this? A number six. I mean, you got to have a super heavy setup six to pull. Eight. 
that planer, even with the bridle, you, what he's saying is you reel up to the planer and the planer's bridle on you and pop it off, but you still got to have the equipment to pull that thing. And it really takes a lot of the fight. Out. I mean, a kingfish on a 30 wide, <laughs> I mean, if you want something to scream, you, you hook up that open face and put some bait down on there. And then when he pops that rubber band, it's... Well, I you a, said 30 wide. Uh-oh, here we go. Yeah, it's, that's that's what you would need to pull a planer in line, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, and can no, you imagine no. fighting a 15-pound kingfish on that? No, I'm, I'm oh, not going to do that. Like that. that be? That's too – I don't want nothing that's going to have to strap me in that can pull me out of the boat. <laughs> it's just it's just a little 30 wide, Wes. It's not yeah, I hear you. Hey, don't make me go get my 14 on. Oh, hell. Oh, oh, I've seen that. Your 14 out with the the drag the size of uh, Ambassador 5000. <laughs> it's got old tire scratch for drag. <laughs> it's star drag, right? Yep. Yeah. But I got it because of the Jaws moves. You were talking about the uh, the the jigging earlier, you know. Uh -huh. That's what uh, that's what this reel right here is good for. No hell! Oh, I thought you were pulling that same one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, if you can jiggle oh, that, you're a man. you're a man. You can jiggle that. Hey, y'all, hold on! I'm gonna go get some of my shit. I'll be right back. Okay, okay. Damn, it's show off now. This is yeah. We're just we don't we don't fish. We, we pull my cloud we out. We just buy tackle and show it off. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know much about like saltwater's new to me. I think that's I like it, but I I found out real quick that between buying shit, gas money, and weather, it's a tough game. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, if I live if I lived on the coast, I just I fish too much. I mean, even if you, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you have to. You have to choose. You have to choose. I mean, I do. I mean, I, I, you I, would save money just going out with somebody, even though you would have to be on their time schedule and everything else. But what's up, Daryl? We got a pretty unless, good. Unless you're Mike Bradford, then you can just throw money at whatever you know. Yeah. <laughs> See where. <it> goes. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're when you're catching the. Um, Man, that was a good fish that Heather caught. Wow. Yeah, it was a nice one. So when you're when you're catching or you're targeting these uh these these bigger stripers in the springtime, mm -hmm. you know, are you uh what what would you consider to be the uh the highest percentage time to go? Morning, evening, night? Uh the highest percentage time. Probably evening, which I never go. But in your evening, you're going to have, you know, where we're fishing, we're fishing cold water discharge. So you're having uh, the water's cooled off, flow's kind of settled in. And But the trick to it is, I mean, you got to know where to fish. When you, a lot of people ask me where to fish, I mean, the fish are moving constantly, but what are you looking for? Are you looking for structure? You're looking for uh, current breaks. You're looking for bait. Um, and hell, we had two bites, so it ain't like we tore them up. We just got a lucky. Got a lucky one. That's awesome. But yeah, the evening bites, which I never fish, like I said, but that's that would probably, if I was just going out to really hope to catch one, it would be. When you're cut baiting, um, are are you are you trying to cut bait up on the banks or you throwing out in the middle of the river? Well, it might look it might look like I'm throwing out in the middle of the river, but I cut bait structure. Like structure, okay. Ninety percent of the time, I cut bait structure. I mean, you might see me out in the middle of the damn lake, but you can guarantee I'm. When you say structure, you're talking like the contours, like uh, underwater points, you know, stuff like that. Uh, anything. That breaks current. Uh, that breaks current. Pumps, uh, points, uh, trees. Eddies. I'll oh, I'll throw cut back <laughs> at the trees, knowing that there's a sixty percent chance that I won't stop them, but there's a forty percent chance I will. You know, mm -hmm. 
but uh, yeah, it's there's always. I'm not gonna just anchor up in the middle of the damn river and throw bait out. Right. I might do good doing that. I don't know. I've never tried, but I'm gonna look for something contours. You don't, basically, you don't know till you throw. Navionics. Use your Navionics. Find something that looks good and. So when you go out there to springtime fish, I know you're a big. You're really, really big on marking fish. Yeah. Do, do you do that in the spring, or is that just something that you do? Is that more of a winter, summer? Do you still try to mark fish in the fall and the spring, or is? is I mean, that it's for when they go deeper. It's a plus. <laughs> I mean, it's a plus if I mark some fish, but I really look for if the temperature's right and it's fishy. You know, I mean, if if there's life, if it's fishy, the temperature's right. Um, if I've had luck there in the past, if I mean, most a lot of time that that fish I had caught was on a spot I've never fished, never fished up there, and I might not never catch another one there. But it was just, I mean, it was underwater humps, there were ditches, what I like to look for, and. Uh, and we sat there for five hours and got two bites. So, you know, one one thing I found from from keeping a, a journal, and I don't I don't keep one anymore. But when I first started striper fishing, I I filled up a couple notebooks of I would write the moon phase, the wind direction, you know, the depth, you know, how all of that, and I would I kept track of it, and I, I kept telling myself I'm doing this because this is going to make me a better angler. I'm gonna I thought it was basically I was making a, a cheat sheet for myself is what I thought I was doing. And it turns out it really didn't work out that way. Like from year to year, things just would just change. They would never be exactly where they were the year before. So I what, I, what I found out for me, what I ended up doing was actually it forced me to, to learn is what it done. It forced me to, uh, start learning and that's when i really started studying the plankton and i started studying how the weather affects the fish and it's really it just made me do like a deep dive into the science behind the fish instead of just trying to use my notes as a cheat sheet from year to year well i think i think notes notes narrow down the lake for you like you know the area the fish are going to be in i mean you, they're not going to be on that same spot that they were on 10 years ago or they, they might be, but they're probably not going to be. But they're going to be in the area. They're going to be in the same temperature, same depth. They're going to be around there somewhere. So the notes did help me a lot. Because, I mean, there's no sense fishing at the lower dam in February. There's no sense fishing the upper dam in uh, August. I might got a cold water discharge, you know. I might disagree a little on the lower dam in February. Well, I mean, there's going to be – there's what we call what we call uh, residential fish, yeah, that never leave, yeah, yeah. But hey, I mean, Scott, yeah, David Mercer's got a question for you. Can you see his question? Uh, help me read it, Wes. I'm getting old. He says, Scott, he just picked up a bait tank to start doing some more live bait fishing. He wants to know does he need to install it on a standalone battery, which is what I would do, or can he wire it through one of his extra switches in his panel? Uh, you can wire it on your cranking battery if you trust it. I mean, it might leave you stranded. You're not going to hurt anything. Um, I would, I would have a separate battery for it, but I ran one on my cranking battery before. Just carry jumper cables and make sure your trolling motor batteries are strong. <laughs> yeah, I would. I wouldn't run it off my starting battery. Your uh, your bills don't pull a whole lot. I mean, unless you're doing a couple overnights. I mean. So really, you know, I, I guess it would depend on how big of a – he's probably got a rule. Uh, well, it depends on what tank. If you got a 30 or a 75, you're to 75. I think that that uh, that rule – I think – I forgot what, what tank, what pump Mel put in his. I think it was a Tsunami. And I think yeah. that, that pump pulled about 2.5 amps. <laughs> Yeah, I would do myself a favor and run it on its own battery. And if it died, then I wouldn't mind time. I wouldn't mind switching over to my cranking battery for a few hours. But yeah, it needs its own battery if you're going to do it. Well, 
Well, hey, I want to show some of my stuff off. Now, listen. David Mercer's got a hell of a boat. Guy, he's got a beautiful. It's a well craft. It's absolutely gorgeous. I see him comment a lot. I need to go on his page and see what he's got going on. Up there. He's got a YouTube channel too, right? Yeah, he does. He's um, he's he's very uh, very professional guy. He's catching fish on lakes that a lot of us would get skunked on. <laughs> Uh, Let's, it Let's see it. That is a Shimano Speedmaster 12. I've got about 375 yards of braid on it. You can't see it. And I learned how to tie a uni knot. It took me about 27 tries. <laughs> Try I'm FG. Huh? <laughs> Try FG knot. I somebody still ain't said, figured it out. Somebody said something about an Alberto knot was easier, and that's a crock of shit. FG is the new. FG. I'm sorry, Scott. Go ahead. But anyway, this reel here, anything that that reel will not put in my boat, I don't want to hook up with it anyway. Um, it's got 40 pounds of drags, two speed, and I've got it on a. I don't know if you can. You can't really see it, but that is a ugly stick, heavy rod. Um. God, you put that high dollar reel on a piece of shit, ugly. <laughs> Well, you talking about putting lipstick on a pig? That's the thing. Know. That's the thing about ugly stick, man. Is you you can put high dollar reels on them, and it's I okay. I should have put it on a big on a catch to fever, but you know how that is. And then listen, this is the first set of lures I bought, and I don't know if they're called. I think they call them plug uh, sluggers or pluggers. I don't know. Chuggers. Chuggers. Yeah. You know those? Yeah. Throw them yeah. in the damn trash. Man. And then they're awfully the proud of those. See, those things cost. And then from the videos, let's see. Wait a minute, let me get this right here. You just hook it up to that swivel. Yeah. And let her ride. Let her ride. Yes, sir. I'm looking for simplicity because I ain't got a damn clue what I'm doing out there. Well, look, Wes, if you want to save a little, I mean, mm -hmm. them. Them lures are nice, but look up some sea witches and tying your own double hooks. I mean, they're really simple, and I mean, you could you could save a ton and catch just about everything you're going after. Look here, brother. Them things right there was forty dollars on eBay, and I didn't have to tie shit. But you might have changed them them Chinese hooks out. All right, 180 pound leaders. Let's see what. Let's look at one here. He's probably got, it's probably got them double hooks on it. No, these are single. Um. It's got a, uh, and it says the eyes. See, I don't know if you can see this or not, but the eyeballs actually move. Are you gonna you gonna rig uh, Valley Hill up on them? I don't know what the hell I'm gonna rig up on them. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I fit on this bitch, I guess. Valley would be good. You could run them naked, but but uh, anyway, Ryan uh, Spivey said, "Where did you get your hat?" Uh, oh, I was gonna answer that, and uh, down in Buford. It's a local place. I like they, it. It's like uh, it's like uh, it's like that crap they put on the floor, sea deck. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's pretty cool. It's rusty. Yeah. Salt water done rusted the hooks out. Richardson one twelve, kind of like that honky hat. That's a Richardson one twelve. It's a Richardson one, I think. No, well, maybe not. Yeah, yeah you, you said it rusted the hooks out. Rusted the screws up. Yeah, Scott. yeah. You you said hooks. Oh my bad. Rusty hook. <laughs> Don't listen to what I say. Listen to what I mean, Jr. <laughs> Let's see what JC Crowder talking about. Can you? Can you? Yes. Yeah. Should you? Oh, he's talking about the the pro motor battery or the starting battery in the base. Yeah, battery. that's correct. Yeah. Fifth battery runs the bay tank. Yeah, I like having my starting battery. Like, that's all I'd use it for is my starting battery. If you've ever had a dead start cranking battery, you can't do nothing with a dead cranking being, battery. Being broke down on the water, I don't care what nobody says, sucks ass. And it's totally different than being broke down in a car, like night and day. Some of my best memories come... I'll tell a quick story. I caught my first 20 pounder at Lake Hartwell, like the first year I was tournament fishing. We caught a 16, 
an eight and then a hit of 21 right at 12 o'clock. I cracked open a beer to celebrate. Sorry, Striper Kings, you weren't supposed to drink in them tournaments. But uh, <laughs> we went, it was about 30 minutes away in. I said, we're going to leave early. And I turned the key and that thing went, nah, nah, nothing. It was dead. What'd you have to do? Get a troll motor better? No, listen to this redneck stuff. Didn't have a, uh, didn't have jumper cables. That's the last time I didn't have jumper cables on my boat. And I unhooked the trolling motor battery, which was uh, too big to fit in the crank where the cranking battery was. It was too big to fit down in that compartment. The cables were too short. Mm. So I turned the trolling yeah, motor battery upside down. upside down and set it on the cranking battery and fired the motor up. Wow. That's some Todd Asher <laughs> shit right there. Yes. It worked. Yes. I went sure right to it, but it works. Me and Anthony Finley, and I'll make this long story real short. We'd been on the boat with Todd Asher. You know, I hired him as a guide first time I ever went to Tennessee. We'd been on the boat for about 30 minutes pulling boards. We caught, Anthony caught a muskie. Turned it loose, tossed it. Let's go up here and catch some bait. We'll come back down here to down the cut bait. Well, he goes to turn the switch over on the boat, and the battery's dead or in hell. Well, so he's running the bait tank battery, just like David Mercer was talking about on his starting battery. So he had another battery in there, and uh, he said, "Well, he said, look back here and see if there's some jumper cables back there." I said, "But ain't no jumper cables on here." We didn't even have a damn knife on the boat, so I knew we didn't have no jumper cables. But anyway, <laughs> he said, I'm going to do a redneck jump start. He said, when I tell you to, take that screwdriver and stick it in the switch and turn it. And Anthony Finley kind of looked back at me, and under his breath, he said, where'd you find this man at? <laughs> and anyway, Todd took the battery, just like you said, flipped it, turned it, and set it on the other battery, and he said, all right, hurry up, turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it. <laughs> Or the water leaks out. Yeah. Yeah. So I turn it and it starts the boat. So that was one of my first time I've ever sit. And Todd said that was a Tennessee redneck jump start. Sometimes so, you got to do shit. But it worked. So yeah. So back to uh, striper fish in the spring. There might be a few people on here wanting to. Like if you fish Harville mm -hmm. right now, I would be from, say, midway up the Tugler, the Seneca down to the river splits. That's where I would be targeting or in the main rivers on the lower end, up the main rivers. And as May gets into June, just follow them down. I mean, they're going to, they're going to go deeper and uh, they're still going to feed shallow, but they're going to stay deeper because we don't have cold water. We don't have uh, a, on Hartwell and, Clark's Hill's got a little bit. Harwell Murray, Murray's got a little bit, but we really don't have a cold water discharge to, you know, you see Watts Bar, you see Daryl and Anthony catching fish all summer with the concrete background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't have that. That's, I mean, that's a different fishery. So if you try to do that here, you're going to. So how does like uh, weather affect the spring bite? Do, do you normally have to? Do cold fronts really play a big role? Do you have to kind of wait on weather to stabilize? It's mostly, a, with me, it's mostly a wind issue in this, this time of year. I mean, you want, I, I fish a lot of big water this time of year, open water, and wind can really screw you up. Um, I, you really don't have a cold front. So I mean, storms come in are good. I don't like calm days. I want, I want some ripple on the water, you know. I want some wind, but mm -hmm. I don't want twenty mile an hour wind. If I, I know do. when I striper fished, I would in the spring, like on the reservoirs that have a lot of big creek arms, like Lake Norman, for example, Lake Murray. Uh, I would head up to the backs of the creeks, but it seems like if we would have a cold front, I wouldn't go as far back in the creek. I would turn around and I would kind of go like midways in the creek and kind of come out. It seemed like the cold front, it's almost like the cold front would actually just bring them back out for some, for whatever reason. Well, people say the cold front pushes the bait out, but it pushes the fish out the same reason it pushes the bait out. I mean, it's whatever it is, pressure. They don't like. I don't believe, I don't believe barometric pressure. And this is just me. And I, and it's really just me agreeing with other people that know. Right, say that's what I'm sorry. I, I, I don't, I don't believe barometric pressure pressure. Play this bigger part on fish in a river. 
where water's moving oh, okay. during the lake. I don't think it does. I don't know water. enough about river fishing to argue, but with a lake, it does. Yeah. I guarantee yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, I, I that's probably true, Wes, because, I mean, that goes for a lot of things. You know, a lot of things, The you know, the plankton play a huge role in lake fishing and there aren't any plankton in the river so you kind of that's why you know you're you're fishing for trout with trout up in the river because those 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 stripers are up in there feeding on trout you know those trout are eating bugs and crustaceans and other fish and so they're not up there eating the fish that are actually feeding on the plankton so it's they're not really affected by it because i mean there aren't any plankton you know, you talk about that, but like stripers, <laughs> they throw everything out the window sometimes. Like some of the best big fish I've caught have been in five foot of water in February where there's absolutely no life, no bait, right. nothing. It's not Are they there? Fish. I don't know. Well, I don't know because the water really temp fish. is like 40. Four degrees but they're uncomfortable up. they're uncomfortable in 40 degree water so why are they there it heats up quicker but right? the big lake's warmer if the biggest fish i've ever caught has always been in the summer it's in anywhere from 58 to 65 degree water I, i've caught one decent sized fish in the winter time. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> you're telling everybody where you fish <laughs> Well, I don't give a damn everybody knows. I mean, it sounds, but see, what it's crazy I'm because no more. I'm new to, to the whole Tennessee trophy thing. So, like, just like two years ago, if you would have said that your biggest fish came in the summertime in like July or whatever you said, and what did you say, 50 degree water? No, anywhere from 58 to 62 to 58 to 62 degree water, water yeah. in in the summertime. Like yes. that is that is unheard of. Like that I was 80 like, feet. JR, that's 80 feet deep. I, I would have been like, hey, yeah. hey, hey, dude, this, this guy has no clue what he's talking about. No, like that, that seems awesome. impossible. Ten yeah. foot deep of water. I know. I'm just messing with JR. Yeah, that blows my mind. Yeah, Tennessee. Mind. People that fish reservoirs and fish tennessee i mean it's it's almost it's two totally different things i mean there's not much that carries over i think the only a lot of south carolina people win tournaments up there though and i think it's because they do different things and um and i i think a lot of the stuff we do works there i think not nothing against tennessee but you guys didn't even worry about having a graph on your boat until two years ago I mean, we we used electronics early. Um, we used different techniques early. Where I mean, if it's easy, why are you going to change? I mean, you're going to do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. I think, I think the struggle we had made us better fishermen. Um, I think tournament fishing helped me a lot with weather. I mean, there was days I would never think about taking my boat out fishing if it was just fun fishing. But if it's a tournament day, I mean, it is what it is. So you and learn what I, it. I think that's why when in 2017, that's really the first year that my friends and I really started hitting wildly hard for catfish. And we had been fishing Norman for years for catfish. And I mean, we're, we're, we're catching like a, a hundred perch. And, and giant gizzard, we're catching the pristine A-lister bait. I mean, this is like the Tom Cruise and Tom Brady of bait. And and, and we're throwing hammerheads. We're, we're slanging missiles. I'm talking 10, 12, 14 rods. And we're doing this a couple of days a week and for, you know, eight, 10 hours at a time. And the biggest blue, blue that we can catch is 25 pounds. That's it. I'm talking years of this. And I mean, the biggest flathead, we, we did catch some flatheads that were in the thirties, but so we, we did this for years on Lake Norman. And then we, we actually started employing and uh, doing those tactics on Lake Wiley. And that very first year after fishing Lake Norman for all those years, that very first year, we were putting trophy fish after trophy fish over the gunnel because of 
because like you're like you said we, we're we're fishing our butts we're used to like you guys were used to fishing south carolina and then you go to tennessee kick ass right and i think uh david mercer uh i think that he's going to be like that because he's he's fishing for he's striper fishing on the catawba chain he's fishing lakes right. like road hiss and hickory these lakes are hard to fish the, the fish are smaller you know catawba is a much has a lot less oxygen it has a lot less that we stock a very minuscule amount of stripers and for a guy like him to go out there and actually have success striper fishing i mean if he if he were to go to tennessee i'm, I'm sure he'd kick ass i mean it helps i mean when you struggle it helps yeah i mean you like fishing lake murray and i mean you guys have been on lake murray fish like a saturday tournament you're in the points running. You got a fish, and they're calling for 35 mile an hour winds. I mean, it's like the ocean. You need a, you need a Grady White out there. Yeah, I've gotten in trouble out there in, in waves. Uh, we we're fishing in my buddy's Bayliner. It was a Bayliner 175 fun boat. Walk through windshield. Oh, you, were, you were screwed when you got in that boat. Man, we went out there, dude. Oh my god, dude. We put in at the uh, you know at the towers, you know, down there, the the big ramp down there. We put in, we, we took off up, you know, we were in the big pool and man, I don't, we, that was before we, we didn't even think about like checking any kind of weather or anything, you know, uh -huh. oh, wow, bro, bro, it's bow dipping. It's, it's like the ocean. I'm like, oh my God, we, we, we had to get out of there, man. We ended up trailering up to Dreher Island and putting it up river. But yeah, I sailed, we, that sail oh, was bad. and a bass boat on that lake. I mean, it gets nasty. Horrible. Yes. Hartwell was rough on the Grady Saturday. Perry, you didn't miss nothing by not coming down there. I mean, that water down there, it's a damn white cat all day long. Hartwell's huge, too. What is it? Hartwell's like 70,000 acres, ain't it? 56,000. Miguel, y'all were talking about fronts and stuff. And I heard this. I remember my grandpa used to tell me this. You know, they would always say, um, the fish ain't biting if the cows are laying down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and they always, I heard barometric pressure affect cows the way it supposedly does fish. You know, it, it's, what is it? It swells, it does something to their bladder. So they've got that feeling like they're full and won't. That's how the barometric pressure, from my understanding, affects that's, fish. That's the way I always, the yeah, that's the way I'll, what I've always heard. So yeah. let's let's talk about the elephant in the room. JR, what kind of hat are you wearing? This is a... Um, uh, okay, real real fast. Uh, Matthew Miles, the creator, the creator of Catfish with a K, uh, apparel. You know, classy. You know that guy, Catfish with, a, yeah, that guy brings you. Now he brings you, honky. honky. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know, I know, I know how it looks. I know how it looks, but you know, there's no like uh, nothing derogatory or, yeah, it's just. I mean, it yeah, works another, good with another, the Dieter Melhorn fish and sleeveless muscle shirt. Sleeveless muscle. I mean, wait, let's see what you got, Jack. Show it. Show <laughs> you got. Hang, hang on, I can, I can do this. Show you got. There we go, baby. <laughs> Where am I? At? <laughs> oh my goodness! Look at that! You got me beat. Where, where's yours at, Wes? <laughs> Hang on, hang on, hang on. He got his calf muscle. <laughs> uh -oh. Hey, hold on a minute. I'll show you mine. No, oh, boy. Oh, no, God. thank God. <laughs> I thought this was going to get ugly. I did too. I thought I was going to have to hit the end button real fast. <laughs> oh. Oh, God. Hey, don't, don't break muscles to a gunfight. Hey, Brian Bear is going to be all over this video. <laughs> don't break muscles to a gunfight, homeboy. Mm -hmm. That's a pellet gun, right, Wes? It's a pellet gun, yeah. Yeah, that's a pellet gun. It's got the orange thing in the front. <laughs> you hear me, Wes? Uh, that's a pellet gun, Wes. Yeah, it's a pellet gun. <laughs> oh, y'all, y'all shell, man. So, is that a custom Dieter shirt, or did you cut the sleeves off of it? Yeah, I cut the sleeves off of it. Yeah. You must be on steroids, like Drew Rankin. No, definitely not on the steroids. <laughs> Shane Real says, if you're on the juice, you got to cut the sleeves off all your shirt. That's what he told me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <coughs> 
Well, so what do you uh so it's straight well damn stripers in the spring you know once they move like i said i used to be planer boards all the time that's when i went to cut bait and i started doing a lot better i went to cut bait in may the first year and then i moved to april actually because mm -hmm. when the stripers do spawn out and you don't know when it's going to be but there's like a two-week lull where nobody's really catching anything mm. they only got one thing on their mind but when they come back down they're feeding hard and um i've done really good in may and june well even april you know cut bait i usually don't cut tournament fishing i usually didn't cut bait before april so you like that post spawn bite well right before they feed out real hard before and the herring when the herring spawn hits the cut bait bite really turns on. I don't know if a lot of herring die or if they just get ambushed shallow. A lot of them go to the bottom, but really, when you when you go to the bait shop and all you can get some little bitty tiny herring because all the big herring are on the bank and the bait catchers only can catch a little herring, then yeah, you need to have cut bait herring on the bank in our reservoirs around here. So here's a question for you. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that you've done a whole lot of night fishing for striper, but I used, yeah, to, be, every year. I used to be huge on it with uh, red fins on Norman and Moss Lake, same deal. I heard Smith Mountain was really good for throwing red fins on points at night for stripers. Is this is Hartwell? Is it a good lake to catch the stripers at night on red fins in the spring when they're spawning? I, in the spring at night, I don't know. Not the person to ask. Yeah. I, I do night fish, but it's in the dead of summer. Mm. And what's funny, that's another thing about, you know, fish the thermocline, right? Fish right. the thermocline. Fish yeah. the thermocline. You know, and you go out and you mark the thermoclines 35 to 65. Okay. All your fish are coming from 90 foot deep. They're chasing the cold water more than the oxygen. Mm. They'll always yeah. chase temperature. You know, we was talking no. about pulling planter boards, and for anybody, you know, I didn't learn this until about two years after I started fishing. In the winter time, especially when the water's cold, if you've got sun, you want to try to put your planter boards on the bank that the sun's hitting, because that's the bank that's going to warm up quicker. Um, you know, and mud, you want to get it up on a mud bank. That water's going to warm up quicker also than anything with a bunch of rocks around it. Uh, like on Clark Hill. Huh? Like on Clark Hill, the uh, what is that one? Is it a little bit? What is it called? South Carolina Little River. Yeah, where the red banks are. Yeah, you know. Oh and, no, that's Georgia Little River. Georgia yeah. Little River. Yeah, yeah. But you know, and, and then you got people that say, "Well, you know, you pull in shallow water, the sun's up. You know, striper don't like sunlight. You know, striped bass don't have eyelids. You know, so the light blinds them. So I always kind of thought that was a catch twenty-two. But like I said, me personally, I've only caught one decent fish. I used to go to Tennessee in the wintertime, go up there religiously with Drew and Todd. Never caught a fish over 30 pounds in the wintertime. Every big fish that's ever been on my boat was in the summer. You know, but there again. That's you fish harder in the summer. Huh? You fish harder in the summer. Well, I don't know. I fish pretty hard in the winter, too, but. Yeah, you're yeah, right, I Alan. I probably don't fish as hard in the winter as I do in the summer. In the you're winter, right, it's a smaller bait. What's what's Alan saying? Well, on Lake Norman, in 2013, they stopped stocking stripers and started stocking hybrids. And, you know, I was actually pretty excited about it. I was like, okay, cool. They finally got, a, you know, a fish that's going to that's gonna survive, you know. And I assumed that they would do the same thing that the stripers did as far as the whole casting red pins on points at night. That's a, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty huge deal. If you haven't done that, you definitely need to experience that in your lifetime. But Moss Lake was very similar to that and Moss Lake has hybrids. So you would just automatically assume, okay, like Norman's going to be the exact same way, but it's, it's not. Now I, Shane Reels told me that, that he's, he's been able to get on them at night on red fins and stuff, but I think he's doing something different. He's targeting maybe, I don't know, flats, something else. But back to you, Scott. Let me ask you a question. All right. I got an answer. All right. Um, let's let's go uh, head, and, head and spook. 
versus Bucktail? What do, what do you like better? Uh, what, do you, what is your favorite top water? Uh, like uh, buck, a Bucktail's not top water. I, I know that, but like, what do you like better between the the Spook and the Bucktail? And then the, my second question is, what is your favorite top water uh, uh, retrieve pattern? Like, I like to walk the dog. I feel like walking the dog is the best thing that you can. I mean, I love. I love slow rolling, slow trolling a uh, walking, waking, wake bait. You know how the red pen, you do it just enough to make it swim so it leaves a V wake. You know, you can see it in the moonlight. You know, that's, I like doing so, that, but I'd prefer to walk the dog. The, the first question, bucktail or spook, I would, a bucktail is going to catch a lot more fish. A bucktail is an awesome saltwater lure, by the way, Wes. Bucktail in the saltwater, kill it. That's uh, basically all a tandem or mojo rig is, is a big-ass bucktail. I, will, I would rather catch a fish on topwater all day. I love it. I love a topwater boat blowing up on the topwater. So the first question was, I'd rather catch them on the spoon, but if I needed to catch a fish and they were schooling, I would throw a bucktail. Second question, my favorite topwater, mm. I think I just found it last year, is a mirror lure top dog. The saltwater lure. Oh, what color? Uh, the one I got is like chartreuse and green. But okay. the thing about it is, even a retard can walk the dog with this lure. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I mean, like a sammy? Re- Like it just walks. Like it, you know, a spook. You got to get into a rhythm and kind of get it going. Right. This thing, you throw it out there and you reel and and, it, and it's just gonna walk. And it's just crazy. Walk. I mean, it's it's a mirror lure. It's made for salt water. It's called Top Dog, and it's – I don't know if anybody's seen the pictures from September. I got on some top water fish down here mm-hmm. in every cast. I mean, they were wow. blasting, I think. And it's got better hooks because – Mirror lure, Top Dog. Okay. That's yeah. great. It's funny you said – as soon as you said a retard could do it, you said a Sammy – that's the only fish. That's the only lure I ever caught a uh, the artificial I've ever caught a striper on was a Sammy walking the dog with it. Well, Sammy's not as easy as this either. I mean, this <laughs> is just like foolproof. It's it's an awesome bait, but it's a saltwater bait. Nobody uses it in freshwater, but they both go back. Like I said, you troll a bucktail in the ocean, you're gonna catch bonita, false albacore, uh, dolphin. What? Just throw it out there and troll it. You can troll it. You can cast it at structure. I mean, you can just chunk it 100, 200 feet behind the boat and troll it at five miles an hour. You're going to catch something. A buddy, some guy told me, he said, Wes, he said, listen, he said, don't take this the wrong way. But he said, if you're starting out, he said, target, target mahi. He said, they're the dumbest fucking fish in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> they're basically <laughs> like said, white perch. He, yeah, he said, they'll literally, he said, they'll hit anything. You know, he said, if it moves, if you see a, if you see one or two of them, and then I didn't understand this unless you're sitting still. You know, he said, you throw at them and you catch one, leave it in the water till you catch another one and then release it. Well, yeah. how the hell do you do that if you're trolling four or five miles an hour? Oh, that's casting. Huh? That's when you're casting at them when they're the puppy, uh, the small dolphin, the pups yeah. when they're up Chicken. behind structure. Yeah. That ain't a trolling tactic. That's when you pull up on big old grass line, you're casting for them. But yeah, they'll Sarg- sargassum. Yeah. Pitch bait rods. But. All right, guys. Well, hey, it's been a great show. All right. We went all around. Yeah. I uh, I do have one thing to say. Uh, I would, um, I would like to, first of all, I'd like to, to thank both you guys for being such good friends to me. And I would like to say that I wish that I could learn how to walk away. Just walk away whenever <laughs> I'm, whenever I'm disrespected. You will learn that. I, I wish I could. I know men that can do that. And, and Scott, you're <laughs> one of those, you're one of those men. I, th- I think that's a superpower. <laughs> hey, hey, so, I've been doing good. Y'all don't see me. When's the last time y'all seen me homeboy somebody on Facebook? I caught J.R. West earlier today. Wes and I have a lot in common. You know, that's why Wes and I get along so well is because you are passionate. Wes reminds me of my brother. We we're like, we're like brothers because he were, 
he reminds me, it's weird because Wes is older than me, but he reminds me of my younger brother. He's like an older version of my younger brother. So we got that and we got a lot of things in common and uh, we both have tempers. You know, I think a lot of people, they know Wes has a temper. I think a lot of people may not know that I have a temper, but I have a temper just as bad as Wes. <laughs> I hate it. When people do that to me, that makes my day. <laughs> yeah, I take it the wrong way. Yeah, I, yeah, you're right. Um, but, you know, some people are just, uh, they're very um, laid back. They're Well, they're good at pushing your buttons. Well, listen. Well, I'm good at pushing buttons. But I, I, I've been good lately. Here's what I, I started you, you, thinking you about. You don't push this. my buttons at all. I, I, I was thinking about this about a year ago. <laughs> I used to let people make me mad on social media, and then I think, you know, there's nobody on social media worth me going to jail for and losing what I've worked for the last 12 years of my life. Nobody. Right. At least it, don't mess with my money and my family, and you don't have no problem. But you can say what you want to about me on See, Facebook. that's, that's you know, where we – Like Daniel Skipper – you know, Daniel Skipper, Chris Hovis, that little half a motherfucker. You know, those boys used to make, they'd make me want to kill him. Yeah. You know, yeah. At one time, yeah. made me want to kill him. I mean, and I don't get like that no more. You know, with social media, if you don't like what I do, you can crack jokes all you want to. But most of the people that's cracking the jokes is, is the same people that's sitting on their damn couch not doing nothing. You know, Wes, so. you can say what you want to. Me and you both, <laughs> we, we'd, we'd lose it tonight. On Facebook, if, right. if, you know, if it came down. Hey, to Scott it. Perry tries to push my buttons all the time on Facebook. Well, Scott just can't. He don't. He can't. He's. You have to be a certain type, you know. I mean, I'm sure Scott could. You know, he could piss you off if he like. But well, you I know, learned this. You have to try. No, Scott's my friend. Scott's my friend. Scott People. would hurt my feelings. He wouldn't make me mad. People right. that do piss me off. There's a. There's a. There's tension there to start with. Yeah. Right. There's right. no tension there to start with. They don't piss me off. No. Right. Yeah. And there's a reason there's tension there. All right. Well, we're getting Dr. Phil and Phillish now. So <laughs> well, you know, there, hey, but there's and there's and there's there again. I'm not gonna say no names or not, but there's some people on Facebook that's very good fishermen, and y'all probably know who I'm talking about. There's a couple of them. I don't like them as a person. You know, as it's, it's being a human being, I, I think they're probably as farthest away from being a human being as anything. But I respect the fact that they're great fishermen, probably but they're better fishermen than I am. You know, I ain't scared to say that. But when it comes to being a person or a human being, their mind's fucked up. But, you know, I, I still respect them for what they do and what they're good at. You know, and, and here's the deal. You don't have to like me, but you're going to, you're going to respect me if you're going to be around me or if you're going to address me. You know, and that's just... The way it should be, you know. If I have, I, I, I have to deal with people every day in my business every day now because I've got a lot of customers. I, I had to deal with some people over at the church this afternoon. I was standing outside in a parking lot at my truck smoking a cigarette, and one of these old ladies comes over and tells Kevin the grounds now. She said, "I wish you'd tell that man to put that cigarette out. He's thinking this parking lot up." <laughs> and, you know. And, I told Kevin, I said, I'll put it out. Kevin said, man, I'll put it out. He said, that lady's 112 years old. He said, she don't have nothing else to get on. That, that last, those, those few little uh, breaths of second hand was going to kill her. Have you yeah. ever seen, uh, you seen Smokey and the Bandit where Jackie Gleason goes, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. That's what yeah. you two need to do. Yeah, I know. Right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I might have to watch that now. Oh, yeah, every time. About. Every time he heard the bandit's name, if he heard that name, the bandit would get all crunk up. I like you guys. You are fiery. You both, you both carry your emotions on your yeah. sleeve. Oh, yeah. uh, Malhorn fishing I, I, I 100% do. All right, guys. Good night. We'll see hold you on, soon. Man. Hold okay. On, man. Okay. Hold okay. On, okay. Hold okay. Listen, yes, sir. Why do you always want to get off when we got watchers? Hell, the other week we had like 10 months of the whole show. And then at 9 o'clock we had 30 people watching and JR's talking about, well, it's been a good show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got to we gotta, we gotta keep them, uh, we got to leave them wanting so they'll come back next week. But JR, are you busy? We're going to show a little bit longer. Do what, Scott? Do you, you got to go to bed or something? No. I don't, I don't Is it date night? <laughs> no. Uh -uh. My, she's already in the bed. I mean, I'm free. Yeah. Um, so why do you oh. want to get off early? 
Well, let me tell about double anchor. Nobody, nobody knows how to double anchor in rough right. water. Let's go to double anchor. I'm going to let you tell that. I'm going to go take a leak, and I'll be right back. Well, you need to hear this because you don't know how to double anchor either. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I You want me to tell you how to double anchor? I will yeah. tell you how to double anchor. <coughs> I have a knot in my anchor rope, and whenever I throw my front anchor out, I'll let out. Well, on Lake, this is what I do on Lake Wiley for the depth of Lake Wiley. I got my boat set up for Lake Wiley because that's where I fish mostly. So. so for Lake Wiley, if I'm going to anchor up, I will let out 150 feet of rope. I have a, I have 600 feet of rope in my anchor locker, so I'm letting out rope. I'm letting I'm letting out rope. I'm letting out rope using my trolling motor to let the rope out. Well, once I get up, once I get to the knot, I know I'm at 150 feet. I go ahead and I go ahead and wrap it around the cleat. I go to the back. I toss the back anchor out. Once once I toss the back anchor out, I walk back up to the front and I pull my anchor uh, rope up. I got another knot at a hundred feet. So I, once I get to that knot, I wrap it around the cleat and then I go back. So I got fifty feet out the back and a hundred feet out the front. That's how double anchor works. That's right. not enough. It's enough in twelve feet of water. That's not enough. There's no current, Scott. There's no current. I mean, you got, what if a storm comes up? <laughs> oh, my God. What if I the mean, wind starts blowing 20? Uh, well, then I'll, I'll, I'll redo it. That's not, no, you don't double anchor with 100 feet out the front back. See, no, I told you you need to I, hear this. 100 feet? Oh, well, okay. Uh, let's 100 feet. What's the ratio? How many feet of anchor rope versus how many deep of water you're in? What is six, six to one is what the Coast Guard recommends, but four to, four to one is – Coast Guard ain't double anchor and cut bait. Four to one is completely ad adequate, and so is three to one. So if I got 100 feet out, what, what ratio would that be? If, I don't know. It's not enough. If I'm in 10 feet of water. You will blow off an anchor in 20 mile an hour winds. Uh -uh, I don't believe that. Uh -huh. well, Scott, Scott. Hey, Scott. Scott, I, I throw the, listen, I've thrown a hurricane anchor, an 18-pound <laughs> hurricane anchor, off the front of that sea yard. Is this the same water. time that guts got ripped out of that 6,500? Hey, <laughs> six and seven mile an hour current. That boat sat there all night and never moved. Because you had current. Don't, you don't had get current. him started. Don't get him started on that what, 6,500. What's the difference? Wind or what, current? If, if you got current, you got that pressure keeping your anchor locked in the whole time. Well, you once got, you're tied up, you got pressure keeping your anchor locked in too. I'm telling you, a hundred foot's not enough. All right, Scott, what's your what's your uh, what's your tactic, brother? So if you want to if you want to fish rods off both sides of the boat, I, we've used to fish twenty rods cut bait, and right. I, I learned this from Warren Turner. I put four hundred fifty feet out the front. Four fifty out the front. Okay. Drop the back. Okay. I pull tight about two hundred off both. When I lock them in tight, you can get 30 mile an hour winds and you can fish rods off either side of the boat. So it's rock there. solid. You like yeah. it? All right, I'll start. Let's, let's back up a minute. When we when me, you and JR was at the tail race, we didn't fish no four hundred feet of water. We didn't fish no four hundred feet of uh four hundred feet of rope off the front of the boat. Well that's I, that's I, current. That's current. Yeah, it's gonna start tight. Yeah. I'm talking reservoir fishing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. I ain't, I don't even like throwing a I don't even like throwing an anchor up for twenty feet, much less four hundred. I'd be dead or in hell. All right, I'm gonna let out. I'm gonna let out more rope. Well, I'm not. You don't have to if it's working. But I, I have. Work, it works pretty good. I've been in tournaments where you know if you get, we would run twenty to twenty two rods, not because we want to catch twenty two fish, because so, yeah, you don't want to be moving much at all. With that well, area. you know. Everybody said, why do you run so many rods? Well, you run 24 rods because them fish are going to be in a certain depth, <laughs> a certain break, and you don't know where it's going to be. It could be 15 feet or it could be 45 feet. So you run rods from 15 to 45 all the way, and then when you find out where them fish are hitting, you target that area, right? So mm -hmm. if you got rods all the way around the boat and you're in the open water at Clark's Hill and, it's, and the wind goes from west – to northwest at 20 miles an hour, you're locked in. I mean, if you got 20 rods out and you blow off anchor, I've done it. No, that's it's bad. ugly. 
Yeah. It's real ugly. <laughs> so so Scott, I've heard I think I've heard people say that you can have too much bait in the water. Do you believe that? No. Mm -hmm. Not if it's got a hook in it. Now I, no. I do believe you can chum too much. <laughs> I chum about people well, somebody was asking me this the other day. Like when I put out twenty something rods, I don't chum because I got chum. My rods are chumped. Right. Hour to two hours mm -hmm. in, I throw four herring. Now this is tournament fishing with herring for eight to fifteen pound fish. I would throw uh, four cut up herring, size so my thumbnail, off each corner of the boat every two hours, and then after two hours, I'd rebate half my rods, and then two hours later, I'd rebate the other half my rods. I like it. Do you believe? Now, what about chum bags? I know in saltwater, you know, me and Shane Howard, oh, you know, we're using chum bags. Do you no. think they work in fresh water like they do salt? You don't have tidal current. I mean, yeah, thank you, Scott. Yeah, you uh, you want your chum inside your bait. You want them fish to have to come out of that deep water past your bait to get to the chum. A lot of people want to sling chum, you know, way out there, but you do want to sling it out there, but you want them to cross your bait. You want them, you want your chum to be near your bait, not past it. I was uh, fishing a weir dam on the Catawba. I'm not going to say what, which, where, or what, because it's kind of a huge secret around here. But so, uh, yeah, I, I was fishing this. Secrets. I was fishing this weir dam, and um, well, how so, many weir dams do y'all have? It can't be that big a secret. So <laughs> we got we got quite a many, quite a few. So, anyways, uh, yeah, I'm getting ready to go. I ain't caught crap, and. Uh, I caught some bait on my way up to it. I had some gizzard shad. Had two gizzard shad out the back on rod holders, and I was anchored up with a claw anchor right in front of the weir dam, and I was casting a, a three eighths ounce jig head with um, gambler swim baits. So I had some uh, bait in the bait tank, and um, so I've been fishing there for a couple hours, nothing. So I was, I'm getting ready to go. So I'm, I'm dumping my bait. So I, I take the bait out of the, the live well and, you know, there's probably a dozen in there. I throw them out in the water and, you know, whole shad, good dollar bill size shad, throw them out in the water, getting ready to go. I make one more cast after I throw that bait in the water. I cast over to the bank, boom, 15 pound striper. Cast over to the bank again. Boom, 15-pound striper. I caught two stripers back-to-back -back after I threw that bait in the water. You fired them up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how that works. We had a tournament, and he might be watching, Leonard Bishop. You know, Bishop Brothers, they used to fish with us. We were at Murray, and they fished all day. had, like, one fish, and he uh, dumped his bait tank. He just dumped it over the side. Stripers blew up everywhere. Didn't have a yeah. bait in the boat. It works. I mean, you know, you, you, that's a, uh, uh, you know, leap of faith to do that. I mean, unless yeah. you really are leaving. I've honestly never seen it. <laughs> I've dumped, I always dump my bait with my rods in the water now after yeah. that, but nothing. No. Me Sam, me, when me and Sam McCarson was buddies, we were in six and 20 one day, and I think we'd caught like four or five fish. We still had an ass of herring. And we did. We, we had we had four down lines out and a free line, and I'm not making this up. So I just went to dumping bait. I think I had like four or five dozen herring left. I just scooped them up in the net, and I was beating them on the side of the boat, you know, to kind of stun them a little bit, like we were doing. Yeah. We them off the back of the boat, side to side. Fifteen seconds later, all five rods went off. Bam, bam, bam. We did get them all in. They were like five or six pound fish, but you know, we went for about two hours there and didn't get a bite. When I started dumping that bait. All five rods go off at the same well, Now that you're a new man, Wes, you and Sam should uh, rekindle your friendship. Uh, you know, I, say, I, I don't know what possessed him to do that that day, but that really, that did make me mad. And then somebody, I forgot who it was, somebody screenshot it, put it on the chain game. So I called Sam and he wasn't answering. And I called, what's his name? Uh, Grady. Yeah, I called Grady, son of a bitch, Tim, for about 30 minutes on a voicemail. And then I, I started to go down there to their boat, and I said, no, nah, I better not. I mean, I just get in trouble down here. But, you know, that was just uncalled for. And I wasn't trying to cut them off. I, my anchor rope knotted up. 
I couldn't get over there. You know, the buoy I used to fish, I was going for my buoy and my anchor rope knotted up and the current carried me down there and I got close to them and they swore up and down. I was trying to cut them off and I didn't even have a rod in the water. So. <laughs> bygones be bygones, Wes. You're a new person now. When was this? This has been a long time ago? What was that three years ago, Scott? Four, somewhere around in there. So, you know. But Sam's a good guy. He brought me some bait one time. Yeah, Sam's I, 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 I don't know if that was. And there again, I don't know if they just did that cutting up or they thought, you know, just trying to, but I didn't find it funny at all. You know, so. Yeah, and that was back before you got control of your temper. It was. <laughs> It's not like now. <laughs> hey, JR, you know what you already done? If I didn't knew Scott was going to be on here, uh, you already played that, downloaded that video again. He did about me and you. You know, he was picking at me and you. Yeah. Where, where he said, that's that fucking CR yeah. that rap music. Said he'd come to here. I'm going to put these hands on him. <laughs> I can't believe as emotional as you two are that you got into it. That's surprising. I, I, I didn't forgot what me and Jr. got into. That shouldn't, it su that shouldn't surprise you. That was. Listen, um, hey, hey, here's what's weird, Scott. When me and Jr. got into it, we were already. Oh, I know what we got into it about. <laughs> Jeff Phil started that shit. You know, he 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 called me and Jr. said, "Get all the video you can on, on y'all striper trip. You know, and I'll make a video for y'all." Mm -hmm. So I videoed for like two days. I was videoing everything, getting on the boat, getting in the boat pulling into the Coast Guard, all this. So, so you're I, harassing the hell out of JR to make that video. Well, no, about six months later, I finally said, JR, where's the video at? And <laughs> Jeff said, six months. Jeff, and then Jeff said, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, said Jeff said, call him and ask him about that video. <laughs> him ask him, and hell, he snapped on me. Dude, I was getting hammered. Y'all boys was hammering me. <laughs> so somebody, anyway, somebody was going to have to get it. <laughs> how much did you get paid for that video, Jeff? <laughs> I mean, in their defense, I mean, I told them I would make them a video. Well, Actually, anyway, <clears throat> well, me and Jr. had some words about that. And he blew up, and then of course, you know, I blew up, and then we, I'm homeboying like a motherfucker. This. <laughs> so, anyway, I told him, I said, "Listen, homeboy, I'm gonna be in fucking Tennessee this week, and you're gonna be there. And we'll get our differences straight." So anyway, we met. You know, we talked, and been friends ever since. And I took him to Chill Howie and put put his buddy Allen. And that other guy put them on their personal best fish. Lacey. I'm sorry, Lacey. L Wes can never remember your name. It's yeah, Lacey. Lacey. Lacey, yeah, yeah. So, Is uh, that a guy named Lacey? Yeah, yeah. Lacey's a good dude. He, he, he's That's a little unusual, ain't it? <laughs> well, it depends on how you spell it. Lacey's my best friend. I grew up, I I grew like up with him. him. I mean, he always... Uh, he watches like our show first. every week. Yeah, he, lo he loves you. He loves you and Wes. He loves, he loves all y'all and... I'd I'd have a Lacey. Try to get a nickname, John Mathena. Tell us <laughs> what you think about clear water. How good they are. <coughs> That's wall dog. John, hey, John Mathena said. Wall John Mathena. John Mathena said clear board. Clear boards are the Joe Biden are the Joe Biden boards of cat of striper fishing. John Mathena <laughs> got a twenty eight foot center console with dual light boards fishing Smith Mountain Lake. He ain't got nothing to talk about. <laughs> Zero. Damn. Who said that? John Mathena said oh. said clear boards were the Joe Biden or the oh. Joe Biden planer boards of striper fishing. I don't even see that. No, that's what he, he said that when we were oh. in Chesapeake Bay. Oh. So is there any is there any questions, JR? Or are we done? Uh, I think we're I think we're done, guys. Oh, no now, he to get, now he wants to get off. We start talking shit about them ragged ass planter boards. Yeah. Hey, Jeff Peel, Jeff Peel on John Mathena a set of clear boards. Well, John wouldn't have put them together, and the hardware broke on him. He could he couldn't even get them to put he together. He didn't know how to use screwdrivers. Oh, that what it was. Oh, I God. want all these guys that hate these clear boards. I have them. Just I'll put my address up. Send them this way. But John Mathena yeah. also don't know the difference in 110 and 220, does he, Perry? I'm going to get some because I can afford them. My gosh, those are any all the other planter boards are like 80, 100 bucks. That's good, what are, good ones. What are, them, what are them goofy boards that catfish guys are using now? Them ones that are like B Cat or something? Yes, they look retarded. I would not. I don't I care if they like pull them. No, you can get your name put on them. That's what everybody likes. What are they called? B Cat. B cat. B cat. What do they look like? 
Put like a marker buoy. <laughs> a marker there, buoy. There, there is like this tall, this wide, that thick. I don't. It may not be the big cats you're talking about. Dieter's no, got it some is. It is. They're retarded looking. I'm gonna have to try. I'm gonna order some. They must be great. Dieter used them. Oh, Lord, yeah, I that, that does not mean they're more. great. I can assure you that does not. <laughs> David mean Hossman great. uses them too. Does he? Yeah. David Hossman? Yeah. No. Does he? Yeah. Really? Yes. I'm going to them. Those are my two biggest wow. YouTube hero stars. Yeah. Size new school. I mean, they're both good. They're both very good YouTubers. You do remember when I heard a new school, right? No. The very first time? No. I was watching a Dieter Melhorn video. Really? I'm his biggest fan. <laughs> and he said, I'm meeting up with new school. We're going to do some fishing. <clears throat> you know, you know. Well, me and Dieter will forever be connected. You know, we're we're both, you know, content creators. We're both YouTubers that are in such close proximity. We fish the same waters. You know, all, like all those Tennessee boys. You know, they're, they'll all be connected. You know, all of the you know the kayak catfish and catfish Dave and Hagen Grubs catfishing and Mark Cooper. You know, all those boys will forever be connected, and all of us Catawba River boys will will forever be connected. So, but uh. Anyways, the video was you fishing with Dieter, right? Well, New School didn't Four. show. New School didn't see, show. Actually, actually, he lied. That was that wasn't true. That was a lie. <laughs> it was on his video. It couldn't be a lie. Yeah, I mean, he said that I was supposed to have met him. That wasn't that wasn't true. Yeah, he made that up. You know what video I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I remember. Know. I remember it. Yeah, it was a bald face lie. Like. <laughs> I'm, 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 I mean, I'm serious. It, it, it was. I wasn't Why supposed to meet him. Why didn't you meet him, Jr.? No. Anytime I was ever supposed to meet Dieter, I, I met Dieter. Why did he say I've that? Never, I've never stood Dieter up. Why did he say that? Um, he stood me up before, but I've never stood oh. him up. Oh, he's just trying to put you under the bus. Like always, you know. That's what he always does. He uh, he comments. He's uh, he knows exactly how he he, he knows how to push my buttons. He well, he does use a PC to edit. I mean, come what? on. Yeah, he'll push my buttons. He'll get me going off, and then he'll delete his comments, and then I'm left looking like a crazy guy. <laughs> well, you know, I'm okay with that. The first time, you know, I was when I started, you know, deciding I was going to go fish saltwater. I googled. I, I mean, I just put on YouTube uh, spinner shark fishing in South Carolina, Merle's Inlet. And you'll never guess first first video popped up. No, oh, yeah, it was Dieter. Dieter Melhorn. Mm-hmm. I was like, son yeah, of a bitch. Yeah, he's, got, like he's got he's got Bay and I'm Earl Zenland. He's got that whole all Earl Zenland shit. is shit. It if is. I was in saltwater, I would not go to that piece of shit. No, I mean the twenty mile yeah. reef is the twenty mile reef can be can be pretty decent. Um it's terrible. The uh there's a reef out there relatively close that's pretty good for trout. But, but Dieter in fish like inshore fish is that it's an awful place to inshore fish. Yeah, it's not that great. Yeah, you're right. Off it, of, hey Wes, off of Hilton Head, where your buddy, is, your hero lives. So I know yeah. you go there. You won't go with me, but you go with Clint. There's a uh, Betsy Ross is 22 miles out of Hilton Head, I think. Wait a minute, what do you mean I won't go with you? I'm trying to get you to go now. I mean, I'm not a hero. Me. I'm just a somebody to fish with. You're my hero too. Anyway, Betsy Ross is a really good area right off of uh, Hilton Head. Twenty, I think it's twenty-two miles out. Now, where's the Georgetown Hole? I've heard a lot of people talk about that, but that's about forty miles out, right? I haven't fished out of Georgetown. Have you ever heard of it, Scott? I mean, uh, yeah, I've heard I've, of it. I've heard of it. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know where it's at. Now, uh, Thomas Talon on a on a post I put on Facebook earlier. He said, Wes, he said, all you're going to find out there at the fishing pan tower is, he said, shallow water and a rusty-ass tower. There's no fish out there. And he said, if y'all, you ain't careful, you'll beat your boat. No, there's absolutely no possible way you're going to beat your boat out there. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And there's always fish out there. He said it's yeah. shallow as shit. And no, I mean, it's it's going to be, you know, like a community 20, hole. It is definitely a community hole. It'll be 20-something feet over the, over the shoals, and you're looking at, it's either forty something or sixty something, or actually around the tower. But um, yeah, you know where I'd like to go that I never went is uh, the Norfolk Canyon. 
It's just a beeline out of uh, Rudy Inlet. And just that is Where's Rudy Inlet? Inlet? Rudy Inlet is um, Virginia Beach, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. You know, if you're you talking ten hour trailer and then chance of going out. Oh well, yeah, I mean, but I'm just saying, you know, since he's got that Grady now, you know, if we were down there, you know, uh, catching the stripers in the winter time, you know, maybe we could like set apart a day to shoot out there to the to the uh, Norfolk Canyon and, and see what's popping out there. I don't know. How so the boys? You it's don't only 80 miles to do west. Uh, 80, 80 miles. So you don't even know what you're getting into, man. No, I just, I, I'm not going. No, I don't know, I guess. I, I just, I, I, I want to do something different. You know, like I said, hell, you know, I can go, you can go out in the ocean, you can take anything dead and throw it on the bottom. You're going to catch a fish. So, Wes, what size fuel tank you got on that, Grady? 82 gallon. Oh man, that's that's awesome. That's plenty, bro. Yeah, we'll just take we'll take might have to take a you know a little bit of extra gas with us. Should be good. What for what? I'm not going out there no 40, 50 miles in that boat. What? What? <laughs> no. 40 or 50, that's like nothing, dude. Have that's you like, ever heard 40 or 50 is just past the breakers? <laughs> have you ever heard of Tread Bar to Jack? No. I might have told this story. He took he used to take his boss, his 18 foot Boston whaler out to the uh the uh, Gulf Stream. Mm. He would carry uh, seven five-gallon uh, jugs of gas with him, and he'd get out there and he would float them. Oh, really? For to like drawing fish? No, he would just float oh. them so he could fish, and right, he would right. troll till he got almost empty. Then he'd pull the jerry cans up back up on the boat, fill the tank up, and head in. Well, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> living on the edge, boy. I mean, you know, that, there's current out there, so I mean, you'd have to keep up with them. And you would hope they didn't get water in huh? Right? Yeah, they, they'd have to be sealed. Yeah, yeah, it's living on. It's a little bit edgy. <laughs> there ain't no fish that I'm doing any kind of shit like that for. Yeah. After, as Perry would say, I'm not that mad at him no more. Yeah. I ain't that mad at him. <laughs> All right, fellas, love you guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody, for stopping by. Y'all have a good night. We'll see you next Tuesday on the Real Fisherman Podcast. Good night. Good night, guys. Good night, everybody.